One of the essential applications of refraction is the convex lens. It naturally exists in our eyes, giving them the ability to form images. Let's start by talking about the nature and shape of a convex lens. Take two triangular prisms as shown. In between, insert other prisms in this fashion. You will get an arrangement that converges light. So let's see what that means. If a light source is provided and it emits parallel light rays towards the prisms, as the rays hit the prism, they will experience maximum refraction at top and bottom. However, no refraction at the center because the rays hit the surface perpendicularly. As the rays start to exit the prisms, they further refract and converge, which means meet at a certain point as shown. If the prisms were replaced with a single piece of glass with similar shape and structure as shown, that's when you get a convex lens, which is also called as a converging lens because it converges the light. It causes the light to meet at one point. In general, the converging lens is thin at the edges to cause maximum refraction, however thick at the center to cause no refraction. Every lens has a center point exactly at the center, a central line passing through that point, and a principal axis, which is a line that is 90 degrees to the central line and passes through the center point. Those are some of the terms used to describe convex lens. You need to know them. In addition, whenever light rays parallel to the principal axis pass through the lens, they will always converge at a point we call the focal point, as shown. The point of convergence is called as the focal point or sometimes called the principal focus. And this is also added to the terms. You also have what we call as the focal length, which is the distance between the center point of the lens and the principal focus. Look at the following lens and find out the things we just discussed. Well, here you have the center point. Passing through it is the central line. And perpendicular to it, passing through the center point, we have the principal axis. And as you can see, we have rays parallel to the principal axis. Therefore, the point where they converge is the focal point, as shown. The distance between the center line and the focal point is called as the focal length. And in this case, it's 10 centimeters. One more thing you need to know which will make it easier later to draw diagrams, is that instead of showing the refracted ray inside the lens, we can just use the central line. For example, if the ray was extended to this point and then from the central line connecting it to the refracted ray, then we can just ignore this ray and connect between them. This would be much more easier later, instead of having to calculate the refracted angle at each and every surface, we'll simply use the central line. Moreover, every convex lens has two focal points, one on each side of the lens. This is due to the symmetrical structure of the lens. This means if parallel light rays to the principal axis came from this side, then they would go to the first focal point. But if they came from the other side, then they will go to the other focal point. So what decides really the location of the focal point and the amount of focal length? Well, there are two factors to consider. The first one is the lens thickness. The thicker the lens, the less is the focal point, as shown. Another factor is the optical density of the medium or the refractive index of the medium. For example, if we have a diamond lens, compared to glass, diamond has a higher refractive index. This means the focal point will be closer to the center as shown. And that's what a convex lens is. Now let's look at the standard rays and how they are used in a convex lens to form images. 
In general, there are millions of rays which could fall on a convex lens and every ray would have its own refraction pattern. But there are three standard rays. When they fall on a convex lens, they have constant identifiable easy paths that you could use to form images later. The first ray happens whenever a ray parallel to the principal axis falls on the lens, we know it's going to refract towards the focal point. And this means any parallel light ray to the principal axis, such as shown. The other standard ray happens whenever a light ray falls exactly on the center point of the lens. When this happens, then the ray will just continue straight. And this means when the ray comes from any direction as shown. And the final standard ray happens when a ray passes through the focal point, then after it exits the lens, it must be parallel to the principal axis. You can say this standard ray is the opposite of standard ray 1. And this happens for any rays falling on the focal point, as shown. Make sure you remember them, they are needed in order to draw images in the coming section. All right, now let's look at how lenses can form images. When light rays exit a convex lens, they converge. As a result, they form a real image. We can use the standard rays to find the location of that image. So let's demonstrate. If we take this schnauzer over here as our object, and from the ear of this puppy, we'll draw two standard rays. This is the first one and the second one. Note that we don't have to draw the three standard rays. If we also take one ray going from the puppy's feet, such as shown, then as you can see, the line extending from the puppy's feet to the ear is similar to this line over here. We didn't draw the rays between the puppy's ear and his feet, but we know they are there. Millions of rays are coming out. So just selecting two points on the object would be enough to form an image. Notice how the image is flipped upside down and magnified. One thing about this image is that it's real. Now what does that mean? It simply means that we cannot see this image directly. If we placed our eyes in the path of the rays, this is what we would observe. It would be like placing your eyes in front of a projector. You would only see bright light. In order to see this image, you need a screen to reflect the rays to your eyes. And you need to place this screen at the convergence point, as shown. As the light rays hit the surface of the screen, then they would reflect towards the eye and that's how you can observe the image, not directly you need a screen. And this is because it's a real image. Now let's discuss in details the main differences between real and virtual images. A real image is formed whenever light rays converge, while a virtual image forms whenever light rays diverge. As shown in here, a real image, the light rays are converging towards the point, and then you need to place a screen at that point. While for the virtual image, the rays are actually diverging, they do not meet at a point. Such as what you can see in reflection, or what you see in refraction. The rays are diverging, they are not going to meet or intersect at a point. So this makes it a virtual image. Another main difference is that for a real image, you need a screen to view the image, while in a virtual image, you just need to place the eyes of the observer in front of the rays. And the final difference between them is that for real images, the rays come from where they appear to be coming from, while in a virtual image, the rays do not come from where they appear. So let's see what that means. As the rays converge towards the point on the screen, the screen reflects it to the eye. Now to the observer, the rays appear to be coming from that point, and they are really coming from that point. They are being reflected at that point. 
However, if we observe reflection, for example, we will notice that the rays come from that point and then reflect from the surface to the eye. But to the eye, it does not know that they come from that point or reflection happened. The eye assumes that they came from a straight path from this point. So this is a virtual position. And the same goes for refraction. The rays come from this point and then from the surface refract to the eye. But the eye does not know the rays refracted and assumes they came from a straight path from this position. The rays of a virtual image do not come from where they appear. They come from somewhere else, unlike a real image. Alright, so make sure you remember those differences and try to imagine them and identify images that you always see, whether they are real or virtual. So we just looked at how can the convex lens form an image. The last thing in today's lesson is to look at the image cases and their applications in real life. Different images with different features can be formed by a convex lens depending on the position of the object in reference to the center line of the lens. For example, if we take this lens, and as you can notice, I label two more points, 2f1 and 2f2. Now this just means that whatever is the focal length, you double it by 2. So if f1 was 10, then 2f1 would be 20 centimeters. So if we place an object after 2f1, the object in this case will be the flamingo and then we draw two rays from the top of the flamingo two standard rays one goes to the center line of the lens and then passes through the focal point another one passes through the center of the lens we can also draw the third standard ray which passes through the focal point and then from the focal point parallel to the principal axis however it's not really needed as the first two already intersected in the same point so we'll just be drawing only two standard rays from now on now notice that at this position that would be the image and this is the first case where the image is diminished which means smaller in size flipped and it's real we need a screen to see this image notice how the object is after 2f1 on one side of the lens while the image is between f2 and 2f2 on the other side of the lens this case is used in cameras for example when you have large objects and you want to get a smaller image of those objects such as shown or naturally used in our eyes the retina part of our eye acts as our screen where the light falls on it and then our brain translates these lights, these light signals into images. So now as we push the image closer to the lens exactly to the point 2f1 you will notice that the image will get further and reach exactly the point of 2f2. This is the second case where the image has the same size as the object however it's flipped and it's real which means you need a screen to see it. Now this case has really no application because what's the point of having an image that has the same size as the object? We'll just directly look at the object. As we keep on pushing the object closer to the lens notice how the image becomes further away from the lens. So when we place the object between f1 and 2f1 on one side of the lens, the image would be after 2f2. And that's our third case, where the image becomes enlarged, flipped and real, which means you need a screen. So what are the possible applications for this case? Well, since we are enlarging an image, this is why it's used in projectors. In the projector behind the lens, there is an illuminated picture coming out from the computer connected to the projector and then this image is being enlarged to the screen. If we further push the object closer to the lens until it reaches point F1, notice the image will disappear. No image will be formed in this case. And this is because the rays exiting the lens are parallel. They do not converge, which means they do not meet at a certain point to form a real image, nor do they diverge so that we can extend them and view a virtual image. No image will be formed. 
and this case has no application. If you place your eyes in front of those rays, what you will see is light without the distinct features of an image. For example, if you look at this picture, the chicken was really close to the camera and close to the focal point of the lens. That's why you only observe light coming out from the chicken, but the image itself is blurry, it's, it's not clear. If the chicken head was exactly on the focal point, you would only see colors without image shape. Alright, so that was our fourth case. Finally, for the last case, we need to move the lens to view it, which is when you push the object closer to the lens and the object becomes between the center point of the lens and F1, what happens is the rays diverge. This will form a virtual image. When we extend those rays, they appear to be coming from a point and that's where the image would be. It's an upright virtual enlarged image. And to represent virtual, you can see uh, next to I, I added a negative sign. But it's okay, you don't have to do that in exams. So that is our fifth case. In order to view this image, you need to place your eyes in front of the rays, such as what you would do with any virtual image. And you probably guessed it, this is used as a magnifying glass. When you place objects close to the lens, you get an upright, virtual enlarged image if the object is between f1 and the center line of the lens so those are the five cases of the lens let's revise them one more time they are extremely important this is our first case the object is beyond 2f and the image would be between f and 2f on the other side the image would be diminished flipped and read and this is our second case, where the object is placed exactly at 2f and the image becomes also at 2f in the other side. The image is the same size, flipped and real image, and there is no practical use of this case. The third case would be if we push the object closer and the object will be between f and 2f. The image on the other side would be placed beyond 2f and it would be enlarged, flipped, and real. The fourth case would be when we place the object exactly at the focal point. At this case, there would be no image, so no properties of that certain image, and this case also has no applications. The fifth case would be when we place the object between F1 and the center line of the lens. In this case, the light rays will diverge and you will get virtual image on the other side of F1. The image would be enlarged, upright, and virtual. Pause this video and remember all those cases with their applications. They are extremely important, especially the useful ones, case one, three, and five. That was the end of the lesson. By now you know everything you need to know about the convex lens. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Please surf this channel for more lessons, experiments, and past year questions. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share.